Thank you very much for having me. Um, I'm very fond of Kirstenbosch and Sanby and Strike and for this opportunity in combining forces. And thanks to all of you who joined to listen. Um, no pressure. <laughs> um, the story I want to tell today um, relates to the books, but I mean, there's so many things that we can say. I can tell you stories about the different fungi that are in the books, um, and but I want to rather tell you stories about the fungi not in the books. Um, and this is without any help, I, can't, I couldn't have done this. Um, firstly, I want to just say thanks to all of you guys out there and especially special friends um, that are there. Um, you all know who you are. Um, without your contributions and your support, I would not be able to do all of these things. And you have been driving, all, driving most of these things. And I'm so glad and grateful to know you. Okay, so with, now I am the guy, the person with the with the mycology degree, but that doesn't mean anything for me because in the sense that there's people out there that teach me um, many other things. But because I am in academics, um, there are some other th things that I want to share with you that's not may maybe as known um, for from the other side. So the title of the talk is this, too many mushrooms to name. Now, that is true in South Africa. They, we, are, we are continuously seeing things that we don't know the names of, which is actually incredibly exciting, not frustrating if you go on a walk and you need to tell people, oh, I don't know what that is. Oh, I don't know what that is. I have no idea what that is. I don't even know what the genus is. So um, that is uh, because we know so very little about our um, biodiversity, but there's also another reason. So the problem of fungal biodiversity in South Africa is that uh, there's so few of us, um, and there's so many, many, many of the native species that's existing. Now, the mushrooms that we see are um, basically the things that you guys see, but most of our research are actually done on the microfungi that we don't see. And that's because most of them are plant pathogens or causing diseases with animals and humans, um, causing toxins, food spoilage. Um, that is the types of things that most of the research are being done. But the true, just because it's out there, biodiversity is actually incredibly poorly studied. Oh, I need to figure out how to go to the next slide. There you go. So there's actually other ways that I can phrase this. Um, as a scientist and mycologist, I don't like to know that there's too many species to name. I would like to name all of them, uh, but obviously there's way too many, um, but we can prioritize. Now that's just not just in South Africa, it's also a worldwide problem that there's way too many species that we will most likely will not be able to actually um, get to naming all of them, even in three lifetimes, but we can try. <laughs> so we would like to know, know that we want to describe all of them. The exciting thing is there's continuous new reports coming in. So some of the fungi that we don't yet know the name of are actually known to science, but not necessarily from South Africa. And thanks to the citizens, the amateur mycologists, we can get names for them and various groups that they are part of. Um, but now the problem is that most of these not I have not been described even elsewhere. And, and that makes sense. I mean, this is the um, a nature group that we I'm giving a talk to. So uh, we know most here and there a couple of new species of plants known. Birds is basically described. The animals are basically described. There's many of the other things that uh, mollusks, um, uh, other types of um, animals that are not uh, really looked at. But 
insects and fungi are really poorly, poorly studied. So we just don't have enough descriptions. It's a fact is that we actually ran out of species name to, with names, because if we, Gary and I have been talking about the next book already, and um, we don't have species with names. <laughs> they are new reports, yes, and a large, large number that many of you guys have um, seen pictures of or um, specimens that simply are not described. They are new to science, new to the world. And those ones are actually our true native cohort of organisms. Most of the things we do have names for are coming from elsewhere. They may have been introduced to South Africa, or um, it may be part of the global range, or in some cases, the African range. But the rest is new. So that's the plea of fungal biodiversity in South Africa. We are not describing our fungi. We need to get started. But before I get to talk about that in more detail, what do we have? What's the pluses that we do have? And there's a lot of pluses. And especially in a couple of years, it's exploded. I was telling Belinda earlier that it's just amazing that first little guy at the right bottom um, appeared in 2010. Now we have it revised with 10 more species added to it and a fabulous mushroom guide that Gary drove. Um, there's also the other guide that you can maybe still get in the shops the, um, by the branches. And then Rieta, who's not a mycologist at all, and she's from Limpopo, who oh, she was just would be make the absolute perfect student, postgraduate student, but she's so meticulous and just like Gary and Liz and John and many, many others of you, Glenn, um, that's out there. But she produced this wonderful book from Limpopo with the help of Professor James, Joanna, sorry, Joanna, um, Joanna Dames and Greer from um, Rhodes University, which you must also try to get. It has incredible nice pieces of South African mycology in there. We also have some iconic monographs. I'm talking now mostly about the macro fungi, the mushrooms, and the things that all of us can see in the field easily. Um, there is, for instance, the famous Deutsch volume, um, Ethel Mary Deutsch from 1950s, where she went and collected basically all fungi, not just the macro fungi. That resource is being noted and um, digitized, but we, I read through that book and I don't even know what the species look like, and I'm a mycologist. So that is untouched. Um, we need to visualize that more in future publications. So then we figured that, well, we don't really know which fungi we have um, in South Africa. Now, I'm again, just talking about the macro fungi. The others are a different story, but we don't have a checklist. Um, we want a checklist. I mean, all the other organisms have a checklist. We want one too. So we started with one. It's, it's incredibly incomplete and out of date. But it's a start. It has a bit more than 1,000 um, species names in it. And it was largely made possible through um, the collections of our national fungorium or our national collection of fungi, which I will talk about a bit later. And thanks to their records, um, we made the list from what was um, um, discovered from South Africa before. We amended it with species that's known from all the field guides and additional scientific publications. I'm still no, I'm we most likely are missing some, but that is the point. It's the start. And we can now continue to update this checklist. Now, this is a national checklist, um, vastly underrepresented, but wouldn't it be nice to also have KwaZulu Natal checklist, Mpumalanga checklist, a Gauteng one, a Western Cape one. Um, 
So there's so much to still that we want to do. And that's thanks to the incredible amateur mycologists who not only photograph mushrooms, but also their inhabitants. Um, I did not yet see a fairy in any pictures, but um, I'm hoping. Um, so this network was previously incredibly frustrating because there's no one, there was no one to help them. There was no information. We had the 1994 field guide, which was a, so still an amazing field guide. But most of the things everybody encounters is not in there. It's not in any other guides as well. So after initiatives that started up by various people and UCT, University of Cape Town, um, they started a Facebook page and a fungi map, um, mushroom map initiative. And suddenly it just started to explode. And we now have an incredibly vi vibrant and active Facebook page. There's um, WhatsApp groups for each province um, and Facebook pages sometimes. And these people are talking. And I talk, talk, talk. Um, I can't keep up. Uh, I apologize, but I just can't. And it, but they drive themselves. And that's exactly what I wanted 10 years ago. Um, uh, but, and again, we as scientists need to take hands with you guys and vice versa so that we can complement each other. But I'm thanking this incredible group. So I was, I, I had a publication where I stated that without the citizen scientists, we cannot really, I mean, I can go on field trips and in Bloemfontein, there's actually a lot of fun driving here. I have been on field trips and so on, but um, it will give me about 200 or 300 maybe fun uh, species that I can work with. But now we sit with thousands um, because of these people who help us. We all know that these mushrooms actually have important sociological importances, um, importance, sorry. So it's not just because I am a mycologist and I freak out when I see a mushroom, <laughs> literally, um, especially something that's strange. Um, and it's just not another part of ecology. They actually have a big importance in our lives. Edible mushrooms, the forages, so this also took off largely in the past couple of years, especially in the Western Cape, um, where Gary and friends were going out on forages. Um, so you can go and get something to cook for yourself tonight. But in many African countries, and including South Africa, it's not just a, a hobby. It's more like this is our livelihood. We can sell these mushrooms. We can grow mushrooms in our, at our own house for our own household because we don't have much money. And then there's obviously other people who do that also for a hobby. Um, and that's because despite being edible, many of them are medicinal as well. Okay, so we also, as I said, have a, a national fungorium or a national collection of fungi, which are um, in Pretoria. It's internationally recognized. There's incredible specimens in there um, and interactions with other herbaria and other researchers who wants to work on our fungi. And that is because South Africa has a, a more than 100 years long history of mycological exploration. In fact, some of the big names from Europe was here in the 1800s and on a trip. And many, some of our own local species were described by those people. So we have everything we need actually to do amazing research and exploration. We have native fungi, I've mentioned before that many of the species are known elsewhere and we're most likely introduced, but we do have our own ones, obviously, which are not. But um, the problem is we don't know enough, but we, here we have, for instance, two species. And when, uh, through the help of the networks, we actually established that up to now, these are only occurring in, it's my husband's, my apologies. I'm back. <laughs> um, through 
all of your information, we basically can think that these two species are only occurring in Gauteng. So they are probably endemic to Gauteng, which is just the most populated and being under overly developed province we have. So um, are they in danger of being missed or uh, um, out of our sight forever? We will see. Okay, the rest of the biodiversity I, mean, I mentioned, we have incredible biodiversity. So um, here's another two species that are native to South Africa. And they are the ones that we know. There are so many more and more that we simply don't have names for. There's incredible, nice ecological stories. I, and we would love to one day just give a talk about ecology of these fungi. They are so important. If you take them away, none of the uh, nature spots that all of you love to visit, where the birds are, where the frogs are, where the plants are, would survive. Um, they form the foundation of any ecosystem on earth and they have various different types of roles. The example here is our termitomyces mushrooms. Um, the one at the bottom is incredibly good to eat. Um, in Kovan, or the steak mushroom, or Ikowa, or many other native names, because it's a truly native one. And it's been cultivated by termites. Without them, there would be no termites. Um, and the termites only eat special structures that these mushrooms make inside the termite mounds. In fact, they are so part of our um, culture that a certain town, which was Elliot in the Eastern Cape is now named after a mushroom. Isn't that great? I don't actually know if there's any towns or cities in the rest of the world named after a mushroom. And we, now we have one in South Africa. The top one is Termitomyces microcarpus. Uh, which I'm sure most of you have seen, they are not typically inside the mound, they are more part of the waste. So when the some termite species take out the waste, these beautiful, tiny, bright, brightly white um, mushrooms grow in, mass, in masses, and it looks like snow. It's like the entire sidewalk can be covered with these beautiful little white mushrooms. We had and are continually getting new reports of species we didn't know we have. Um, Macrosabi lobiensis has an interesting story at the bottom. Um, it was in, in the St. Lucia area where it was first spotted um, during a game drive at night and the children of the game warden saw it and they were so crossed because they thought it was plastic. And um, they, when they went to look at uh, they saw this humongous, humongous mushroom. Now, that was not even the one I took here. It, it was a previous one. It was literally as big as the entire white patch you see there. Um, I didn't know what it was. No one knew what it was. We asked our international colleagues, and they told us, oh, it's a macrosibi lobiensis. It's um, commonly growing. Uh, further north in Africa, where you can imagine it sustains a, a, a household when quite significantly when they find one of these. And since then, it popped up in Pretoria and in between areas and so on. So it's actually not that restricted, but we just didn't know. <laughs> we had it. Heliosibi sulcata is another example of the many things that Liz Popich, for instance, finds she's not the only one of things that she could get names for um, and we didn't have them on any list or any publication or any field guide. Now, now I'm going to switch to the in-between part so most of the species are known from elsewhere that's what I said at the beginning. So we identified what we have based on North American books or European books or New Zealand books or Thailand books. Um, and then we get the name and we're very happy. That is now those besides the ones that was already in previous field guides. Um, 
the previous field guides of South Africa, most of them also took this route um, to identify their fungi. In some cases, it was done, however, also in collaboration with international experts. But we identify our fungi based on to knowledge from elsewhere. But that is now the problem because that means it's not truly necessarily our native fungi. It's things that occurs elsewhere that could have been introduced into the country, like probably in pot plants in this case, or with pines, or um, we don't even know how it was in, introduced into South Africa. So what about our own native collection of things? And that is the problem. We have so many unknowns um, and we don't have names for them because they are new, they are undescribed. And that is a big problem that an, uh, very intensive campaigns must be made to actually actively start describing our various fungi. Now that is quite a challenge besides the fact that there are many because they are so incredibly diverse in morphology and just like any uh, the systematics in any organism group, they are expert for this and expert for another group. And um, now we want to describe, want to describe everything. So that is rather a bit of a challenge, but it's also an incredible opportunity. Um, during previous visits overseas, for instance, I realized that if you go on Europe, for instance, where everything is basically known here and there, maybe you'll get a new species. And it's also well known because it's a part of the culture. You sit with baggage, you sit with lots of name changes, previous dilemmas, and that was not yet solved or was solved, but another person doesn't agree. And um, you sit with that, but we kind of have a clean slate. We can actively go out and describe what we have from nothing. Um, Obviously, it may not be necessarily correct, but that is why later on you revise the status because then you know more, at least now you know you have five specimens from a certain species that you can focus on instead of nothing because no one looked at it before. We need to do microscopy for that. Um, when you describe mushrooms, you don't only do it from the outside, most of the features that often describe species and even two genera that look very similar is under the microscope. But that's also very exciting. There's so many, many interesting features and things that we, you discover. It's actually one of my personal things because um, I am a taxonomist, but I worked on other groups of fungi. I have to learn all of the jargon and the things that I need to look at and look for, for mushrooms from scratch. Um, it was never taught to anybody really um, in South Africa. Man, that's exciting, I like it. <laughs> then through the help of many of you, um, we are started to sequence these. Now, ideally one would think that you sequence it and you'll get a name and it's lovely. And, some cases we do have that, where we had identifications confirmed based on DNA sequences that was done by people from outside South Africa. Most of the time as part of taxonomic studies, but other times it was also just first reports or they looked at what was in a certain forest or things like that. But still, we can look up our fungi now with international studies. Um, the morphological route is also possible, but that is rather tedious since you have to go and request all specimens you can find. It must come to you, you need permits, and it, uh, with the DNA, you can do it at night uh, after you've got the sequence because of international databases. So yes, it helped a lot. And there's examples a bit later where I can show you, oh, now we finally know what this is because it, it happened to blast or group with another representative of a species that we were not quite sure if it's that species 
or simply we didn't know <laughs> it was there was a species in the first place. However, there's also a lot of problems because um, in this case, the data that we do have don't always give us the answer. <laughs> and actually, in that case, morphology is the fallback. You need, morphology will help us in this case, hopefully. So you don't need to understand everything on this slide. Um, it's two specimens by Gary Goldman um, from Western Cape. And it's not Lactarius um, uh, deliciosus or the other Lactarius species that we know occur in South Africa, but to but a possible new report of a new spe of a species from elsewhere. Unfortunately, we don't know if it's hard to darky or quite a color because the particular gene we used is not showing that, but still it is incredibly exciting. It's the first report of whatever the species is um, for South Africa. And it's actually very interesting because Hatsudaki is an oriental species and quite a color is more known from Northern Europe. And now we have it in South Africa. Uh, yeah, <laughs> so again, an introduction. Um, here is a case where we could confirm a name, a cocaine or colensoy, um, a specimen from Les Popich in Pretoria. Actually, that yeah, was a very nice answer. And there's many more examples. Okay, so I did say that we do know something about the ecology and there's so many interesting stories, but <laughs> actually we know nothing. <laughs> if I can make such a strong point, if I go into a forest, I can assume um, this is a saprophyte, it breaks down organics. This is a this and that's a that. If it's a new species, I can probably assume it's a uh, degrading organic material because it's growing on in the soil or it's growing from a dead woody stump. But no one studied it. No one looked at what these species are doing or some of the native species. I don't really think there are any studies. Uh, but if you go, for instance, to Europe, um, I was on a field trip, a very privileged in Macedonia, and they, this one person, uh, actually a couple of them, um, they collected things and then they would tell us, oh, this one prefers acidic soils, this one prefers that, this one will only grow when it rains three times a day, or something like that. Um, it, I don't know that of our fungi, um, does any? Um, there are some of you who actually have observations like that, but it's not scientifically studied. So why is it important? Um, well, it is important because it's part of the ecology of that particular ecosystem. Why did we do that for plants? Why are we studying whether some plants like acidic or basic or lime or whatever soils? Why don't we do the same for our fungi? Um, I'm sure there are very important lessons to be learned, especially now with global change occurring. Anyway, there are a lot of those that I can say. Then conservation status. We don't have any fungus um, that's been red-listed in South Africa. We don't, we have a couple in South Af in Africa, but not actually so much. Um, but still, do you think that fungi must be red-listed? Of course they must. Just like any other species of plant, of animal, of um, uh, insect, um, things in the sea, we must know whether they are threatened or are they okay? Did we lose them already? Because um, that is sometimes the problem, is we don't even know if we lost them. Um, most of the time, our fungi are luckily inclusively protected in a nature reserve because it protects the other things. But still, we don't really know how what we do in the park affects them. For instance, Moraleta Park in, in Pretoria has a lot of feet and bicycle um, that travel there and people doing picnics. For all we know, that disturbs the ecosystem for some of these very, very sensitive species. No one is looking at that. But it is possible to look at the red listing of fungi. 
and there are hopefully a couple of assessments coming. Then I talk a lot about um, fungi that were introduced, um, which ironically is the ones we know best. But there is no fungus that's really a macrofungus that's really um, officially defined. It's no, there's no one that there's an official publication that said this is an introduced one, this is a native one, this is a naturalized one, this is an endemic one. We know this and we assume this, but there's no real studies like that that has been done for plants and animals, for instance. Um, but there are studies looking at that. Um, and then we also would like to know, are they actually invading? Or are they, they are here, but they are not really impacting so much on the native wildlife. Life. The second question from this is that it's actually, do they actually impact on the native fungi? We don't even know what native fungi we have, etc. Do I Do I make my case? <laughs> okay, then we also have incredible ethnomycology stories and other uses in South Africa, and I was very fortunate to meet, besides people already know, to meet Cullen from um, Haga Haga, who has actually done this, who looked at the ethnomycology of South Africa. Incredible, incredible stories coming. Um, one example is that more general is the psychedelic mushrooms, the hallucinogenic ones, the magic mushrooms. Uh, here you have the blue mini. Um, and it's um, not only for people who are, like to use them for recreational use, although it's illegal, but it's also incredibly useful fungi for neurological um, research into depression, into migraines. Um, they seem to be more, in some cases, more effective than the, the antidepressants some people are actually using at the moment. Um, so immense potential there. And we have one, at least one native one that we know of, psilocybe natalensis. Now, even those fungi were not well presented in the past in all the previous field guides. Um, so we were very lucky that in a revised version of the pocket guide, um, John McGillifray from Durban contributed um, most of the psychedelic species in South Africa. Um, he might probably tell you it's not most, it's just a, some of them, and it's probably true. Um, but except for one species that's currently um, known for South Africa, uh, most of them are now included in the most recent field guide, uh, pocket guide, sorry, and in future ones. Okay, so I end off with what do we do? Ah, we go and do what we do and love most. We look for our fungi, we explore, we collect, we, we share it with our WhatsApp groups and our friends and the Facebook page. So thank you to those of you who are doing that because now we have an awareness that I think 15, 20 years ago, we didn't really have yet. Um, now we just need to build further on that and start eating the elephant piece by piece. So thank you very much for your attention and this opportunity. And all the beautiful pictures was not mine. It's all from citizens and citizen scientists and mostly from Liz Popich, um, Glenn and Gary and John and I probably missed somebody. So thank you very much for this making me very happy when I look at all these beautiful things. Ladies and gentlemen, wow. Um, <laughs> Mareka, I, you, you are just amazing. I think, um, and um, what I'm appreciating most is um, we finished right in the nick of time, um, just enough time for us to take a couple of very complicated questions, if I may put. Uh, I think some of the, uh, scientific names that you've mentioned throughout your presentation uh, are just so interesting. And I think we've got equally interesting questions uh, that are coming up on the chat. So 
Uh, ladies and gentlemen, let me apologize in advance if I'm butchering some of the uh, scientific names that are that are going that I'm going to be reading um, out as questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I've got the expert with me, so I'm in good hands. So I have no worries at all uh, as uh, to read out some of the questions that are coming out. Uh, let me start with Mr. David Taylor. I, I'm hoping um, I, I'm getting your your questions correctly, uh, David. Um, he's asking two questions. And firstly, um, he's asking, how can um, Rasula uh, capensis be a species? And then he continues, says, I assume capensis means it is from the Cape of Good Hope, but since it is uh, myocorias, myocorias, um with, with pines, it cannot possibly be, South Af uh, be a South African species and must have been named earlier in Europe, unless it has divergent or diverged uh, far enough within the last 300 years. I feel so, I feel so educated right now. I'm, I'm <laughs> saying names that I don't know. <laughs> Over to you, Marika. Excellent, excellent question. Um, it's been bugging us as well. Um, um, Gary sent me a specimen, we sequenced it. And I was thinking, oh, yeah, I was going to group with uh, one of the hundreds of Rasula species, which is at least a group that's rather well sequenced. It's not grouping with any of them. <laughs> um, but uh, we, are, we just want to confirm it a bit more. But it is true. It's, it can't be. It can't, unless we are missing a mystery mycorrhizal host, maybe a, um, a Podocarpus or a with Antonio, that I don't, uh, we were, it, I don't even know if it really has these mycorrhizae on it. Um, it cannot be there because the only hosts we know of are all exotics. They all introduced a mycorrhizal host that were introduced from elsewhere. And Rasula is mostly known from Europe and then throughout Africa. Okay, so they're in Africa, but they have been. Um, they are associated with Mionbu um, woodlands that starts basically from uh, Lutrichard, whatever its name is now, further north. Um, so what's it doing in the Cape? And we don't know because it's actually rather distinctive. Even I've, I've asked some people from Belgium about it as well. Um, but yeah, we don't know why it's here. Are, are there maybe some mystery species elsewhere in the world that's not yet been sequenced. So, same with samples. <laughs> Next question. Sure. I think um, I think I think it's um, it's it's well in line. Just maybe to ask a quick follow up question from David, who says, uh, secondly, um, and I think you've touched a little bit on it. Uh, he says, what can be done about the severe lack of genetic sequence available to aid in describing new species? For example. Um, he has found a Tricholosphorus sp in the Western Cape, and he is hoping to describe it with Gary. Uh, but there are only two sequences available uh, for two of the 15 accepted species um, in the genus. Um, using uh, morphology alone could surely lead uh, to renaming an already named species. This is obviously a very scientific example. Uh, but he imagines uh, that this is a problem. Um, let me just, uh, this is a problem uh, that is, uh, is faced extremely often. Yeah, that is very good assessment of the state of affairs. Um, <laughs> in some cases, yes, we are lucky and we have well sequenced representation of species in a particular genus. Um, then it will be easy to pick up oh, my, the species that you guys have found is this or that or so. Uh, there are a small number of groups that are well sequenced for South Africa, but compared to what's still out there, it's like 0.01%, I think. Uh, I don't think I am overestimating it. Then, then you have these groups that are poorly sequenced, um, only two of the 15 species. So in that case, you will have to do the morphology. Um, uh, if you're lucky, the descriptions of the other species will be good enough. 
and you will have to then do the microscopy and everything to compare your observations to those. And if you have a new species and you have a very obvious difference, then you describe it. Description is a rather formal process, but possible um, for anybody actually with a microscope and who can publish in uh, some of the international journals. You don't have to be a PhD or a mycologist to do that. You just need to um, follow the correct things. Um, so in some cases, then you have groups that are problem. Um, so like Paniolus, um, I have a student working on Paniolus, for instance, we already know Paniolina has been split off from it, but there are so many groups in Paniolus and the species names is all over the place. It's just chaos. Um, so then it's a bit of a problem because there isn't even a distinct species you can compare it with. So for what's necessary in that case is for someone to study this group in taxonomic detail, looking at the specimens yourself, um, morphologically sequencing them all. Everything must be standard uh, and comparable. So obviously that is not happening often. Um, African species are rather underrepresented. Most of the monographs like this are focused on USA or Europe or um, other um, hotspots of study. So yes, it's a problem, but also if you then, in, to come back to your tricolosporum, um, the, the sequence, um, you cannot really then say it's this or that based on only two species um, actually being sequenced. So then you will have to look at the morphology and you can describe it based on that difference. It all falls back to the morphology always in the end. Awesome. Um, <clears throat> uh, let me take two questions. Um, one is um, one of particular interest to me is how, um, and it's coming from Roger, is how can one tell if a mushroom is poisonous for humans or not? And uh, let me also take this one um, uh, from Rudy, who's asking, how does one become part of the WhatsApp group for the micro group? Um, yeah, just two general questions there. Okay, so um, poisonous or not, you don't know. You have to know the species. And I think it's being said clearly in all the books, um, any book actually, <laughs> that you will get on mushrooms because mushroom poisoning is a reality and can be fatal. Um, there is not like frogs that you have a red frog and it's most likely poisonous. It can be red and be edible. Um, so you only need to know what that specimen in your hand is. What is its name? And so you'll have to get all the necessary um, features that's needed to distinguish it and to distinguish it between lookalikes. And there's usually a lookalikes for these poisonous ones. And that's usually being indicated in, in guides. And the second question, um, there are various WhatsApp groups. It, where, if, it depends on where you're from. Um, you are welcome to contact me um, after this talk, and I can tell you. Um, would you can then uh, um, go and ask to add you to the group. Um, I have a, a blog, the mycology blog, all one word, dot com, and the groups have been indicated on one of the con on the contact page i hope i'm not missing any of them um but yeah the people you can contact is on there the mycologyblog.com awesome um i think that's great uh, our team be working behind the scenes um uh, belinda and the team i uh, will definitely make sure that we circulate all that information and uh, share it with everybody on the call today gareth asking a very important question as well uh, apart from research and, and cultivation, are there any career opportunities uh, for someone interested in mycology? Um, are there any work or is there any work being done uh, in micro uh, in micro, uh, micro remediation, for example? Um, there's micro remediation being driven largely by you guys, actually. Um, in the 
couple of cases I know of where the fungi in academia are being used in um, ecological studies of soils and soil health and things like that. There are those studies and most of those people usually also look at um, 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 uh, composting and things like that. And in some cases also microremediation. I think uh, if you're interested in this, you hook up with an academic uh, and ask that person to help you to do this. Um, it's all possible that we have the tools, everything. And most of our stories are usually from elsewhere. Um, but we need to find our own solutions from South Africa. We maybe have better fungi. We most likely have better fungi than some of the solutions that comes from elsewhere. There's also a very nice group in by Professor Damas, Joanna Damas, that works with the mycorrhizal remediation projects and things like that. So yes, there are opportunities. Um, job opportunities, um, it's growing. Um, fungi are still a bit more under the radar than more other things. For instance, there's no one at any museum in South Africa that works on fungi, nowhere. Um, so those of us usually end up at in academia or at the Agricultural Research Council um, and things like that. But so it's not as visible as others, but the edible part of it is very visible. And there's a big industry in South Africa. You, there's lots of research opportunities for that. Meow micro remediation because it's so applicable. And then the uh, even internationally, there's a big search in the applied things, what you can make from fungi, what, how can you use them for everyday problems. You can make bricks from fungi. You can, you can use a fungus to make plastic. Um, oh, no, no, I have it the other way around. Um, you also have one that takes the plastic and converts it to edible product for your livestock. There is so many different types of things that you can develop with the um, characteristics of many of the fungal species. Where there's a world, there's a way. <laughs> sure, no, beautiful. And, um, and, and maybe something maybe that you can just comment on um, um, just a little bit later is in terms of, of funding of individuals that wanna go into research space and uh, where does one source that type of, 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 of funding? Uh, perhaps maybe you could also touch on yeah, uh, I mean, there are so many uh, mushroom species, you know, from, from the title of your talk. Uh, out of the many uh, species that are out there, in terms of percentage-wise, uh, what would you say is, uh, is the percentage of edible um, mushrooms out there? Let me ask this question quickly from um, a, a caller on the line, uh, saying, as an aspiring uh, myologist, uh, what has been... Um, what the person has been wondering uh, recently is whether it is whether it is crucial to actually memorize and be able to identify all the name species of fungi, uh, since it is uh, quite a, a daunting task. <laughs> yeah, um, I think I could answer that one. And um, there's a book available, uh, so please make sure you get yourself uh, that book. Get your hands on that book, but Prof, please go for it. Um. <clears throat> I can't remember all the names myself, okay? <laughs> like seriously, um, I should, <laughs> uh, but um, I often also forget. Um, but you know more or less where to look and you have a handle of how you can find that. Um, th that's all purpose of names. Is it's a handle to get to um, a specific species and all its information. Um, especially daunting even more than just knowing everything is that um, many of their names keeps on changing and now you are used to the old name and now it, it's only found in books with the new names and now you can't find it so but it's still there's a way that you can trace um, the information back and forward to the new name um, but normally um, I don't think it's a function that you must know the name so that you can be successful or, or as a good mycologist. It's more a function if you're uh, uh, curious um, and 
meticulous and um, hardworking mycologist or amateur, you will probably know all the names. I don't think you need to worry about that um, because you will remember them because you will make it part of yourself, your heart, because you like them. Very true. Um, uh, Vanish is just asking, um, there does not appear to be many deadly uh, poisonous uh, bolitis, uh, if I'm and uh, calling that correctly. Is that reasonably correct, uh, Marika? Um, well, <laughs> the, the ones that we basically know in South Africa um, and the proportions of that you'll find in the books um, is basically known on things we know um, because we could read up Oh, we found an Amanita mapa, and we could read up in the many other publications from elsewhere in the world. Oh, it's this or that. So, um, so based on that, we basically know what we have. But what about truly native ones? Um, there's no other publications. So I'm not quite sure about that. However, there is a proportion of native knowledge um, by various peoples in South Africa who can tell you that they probably use this for that and don't eat that because it's not good for you. But um, I don't think that thus far has been really um, adequately reported. So it's a bit difficult to say. In general, if you look at international books as well, it, the proportions of poisonous is actually not that great. Most of them are usually harmless and um, some of them are edible and some are not really worthwhile. <laughs> you could probably eat them, but for why? Why? <laughs> because it's just um, hard or tasteless. But so those proportions are usually low in general across the world. So, so Doc, um, in terms of um, health, health properties, you know, you've, you've spoken of uh, neurological benefits, you've talked about... Um, inflammatory benefits from from eating uh, mushrooms what can you is it eating mushrooms or the signs of mushrooms themselves themselves and what would you say would you say mushrooms should become part of our dietary plan on a daily basis or as regular as we we can in order for us to yield the the benefits that come with it definitely um many of them have proven medicinal um uh, um, compounds and things that can definitely improve your health. Uh, the, uh, nutrition wise, they are excellent and somewhat even more excellent in the nutrients they contain than others, besides the fact that they are not just a mushroomy taste, they, it's culinary art. It's Some of them taste like this, some are taste differently. The, uh, one of the most expensive foods you can get in the world is a truffle in Europe. It's horrendously expensive. I've not, never tasted it um, myself. So um, why not? Um, the problem is, and it's a bit better now, in the past you couldn't get anything but a denny mushroom. I always call it denny mushroom. So the white ones that you see in the shop, maybe you'll get the portobellinis more. Um, but you don't really get the others, the oysters and the shiitake and, and so on. But now, the past couple of years, it's picked up a lot. And what's also increasing, uh, besides those who always did it anyway, is the people cultivating them. So if you want to get them, it's, it's not difficult to get them. There are probably someone in your neighborhood doing it. <laughs> Awesome. Let me take this uh, last question, and uh, I have to just uh, say that just um, uh, the other things that have just been coming up on the call is just the general comments on the awesome presentation that you've provided, just um, the quality of content that you've given. Uh, so a lot of the uh, people on the call just, you know, showing love. Uh, we just want to direct them to some of the information that you've just shared in terms of checking out your blog of which uh, we will definitely share those details and make sure that they are uh, up on Facebook. We'll share them on our social media platforms just so that everybody can have easy access to them. Uh, but let me take this last questions from George. Uh, George is saying, thank you, thank you so much for the talk. Uh, if we find something interesting, 
um, we can photograph it, uh, we can photograph it uh, as a reference, but how uh, should it be preserved to allow genetic and spores analysis? And um, uh, this is just with regards from George and Margot uh, branch. Wonderful, it's nice to, to get a question from George and Margot branch. <laughs> um, well, Gary has been sending me things um, as well as specimens that others of you are, have sent. I'm, I must confess, very slow in giving you answers at the past couple of years. I'm, I'm building up capacity in my own laboratory and my own time is not always that, that freely available to look at the results of it. Um, so I do apologize. Um, but the, there are various ways, actually you can do it besides me, but um, the way you preserve it is you dry your specimen as it always was, because I always would like to have the original specimen to, in case you have a new species, in case it's a first report, in case it's one of those Lactariuses where uh, we now have to look at the morphology to figure out which one it is. Um, so I want the original preserved specimen, just like you have for plants or, in, or insects. Um, then you can take a piece of it. I usually say like a pizza slice and you can take, put that in, in a container, but usually I can do that. Um, once I have a specimen, we do it from this side and from there on it will become just going through the process. Um, fancy ways or there's different buffers. Um, I'm not too fond of the ethanols that are usually used for barcoding or for insects and so on. But um, I talk too much about the same thing, but the bottom line is uh, slow heat, <clears throat> not high heat. It should be dried and sent. Um, you can also use um, uh, silica gel just to make sure it remains dried out, if, especially if you're in the Cape and it's humid. Or horrible places, KwaZulu Natal, you dry it out and then it just becomes moldy again because it's um, so humid. Um, so, what we then do is we start with the first um, the, uh, barcoding gene, the internal transcarb spicer, which is the data that you saw on one slide. It's not ideal always, but it's the one that's been sequenced across most, if not all, fungal species. So you, the chance for you to get the right answer is high. Um, for the more um, detailed studies, you would, you would use other genes, but the problem is that's not always available. So for instance, you can now see uh, for the uh, Lactarius, we need the other gene to actually distinguish those two species. So then you just go a bit further. And the analyses, um, Anybody can actually learn it, but um, I guess you probably need a little bit of scientific background um, because you cannot just, I don't like just uh, searching the sequence against the database. We need to put it in trees because um, the South African fungi are so poorly sequenced. You're going, it's like going into a library and now you want to look for something that are similar um, to a book you read, a theme of your book. And now there's three books in the library. So now, because you want to read, you take one of the books, but you obviously did not find your theme. Um, so the more representation there are on the um, databases, the better the answer would be. And that is at the moment still our problem. I hope I answered your question. No, definitely you've done it great justice. And um, you know, questions keep coming, coming through and all of them excellent, uh, especially this one from Evelyn, um, who's just asking about the sudden resurgence uh, in the interest in, in mushrooms. Um, why is the subject trending like wildfire, for instance, you know? Um, I think for the sake of time, and um, you know, we've been in, on the call for quite a while. I don't know if you are able to answer that in literally 15 seconds. Why is there sudden resurgence of interest in mushrooms? Um, I think it's because the books that came out, there are were always people interested in it, but there weren't tools or people available to help them. And 
I think what also helped a lot is the uh, um, University of Cape Town, the Animal Demographic Unit started up the Facebook page and it just exploded. And from there, um, groups were formed. The WhatsApp groups basically came from there, more or less. And suddenly there are people who can help you. It's not just... The community is there and now there's more support. I think, right? Awesome. But it, and there's so many different cool things and people want to know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I think, um, uh, I think, uh, I think it's uh, good enough for us to, to call it a day. And uh, it's been an absolute mind blowing presentation. We've learned so much. I've learned so much about uh, different scientific and genetic names. Um, and, and most importantly about just the, the general health benefits of mushrooms. So thank you very much, Doc, for, for the wonderful presentation. Thank you for making time to be with us. Uh, based on the interest that we've had in the many questions and just the general good comments that we're getting of just saying thank you and appreciation to you. And uh, we will definitely uh, call you again and uh, just come and have a chat with us again. Uh, Cause I think this is one of those most interesting uh, uh, talks that we have. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, that was um, Dr. Mareka uh, Hold. I got it this time. <laughs> that was like a tongue twister gymnastics in my mouth and I love how it sounds when I say it. So thank you very much, Doc.